All right, welcome. This is Professor Dillon, and I have this short little video to review just some basic chemistry, stuff that you should have had in high school, but we want to review it before class. So, as you can see, this PowerPoint presentation is entitled Atomic Theory, or a Quick Chemistry Review Review. And here you see a Bohr model of the atom, and this represents the nucleus of the atom, and then these are little particles orbiting the nucleus of the atom. So let's get into it. So let's do a little review. Um, in class, we talked about what to science study. So do you remember? Hopefully you remember that we discussed that science is a tool to, a tool that we humans use to obtain knowledge about what? Are you thinking the natural world, the physical universe? If so, you are correct. All right, so let's dig into this a little um, more deeply. Um, what are the components of the physical universe? I mean, obviously there's millions and millions of things in the physical universe, but if you have to boil down the physical universe into the bare bone basics, uh, you can say that the physical universe is composed of matter, energy, and forces. In fact, physics studies the ABCs of the physical universe. If you've ever taken a physics course, you know this is what the, um, physicists study, matter, energy, and forces. So what's matter? What's the matter you're thinking? All right, well, matter is literally the stuff of the universe. I mean, it, we can literally get a grip on it. You can hold your coffee cup. You can splash water. You can even move your hair, move your hair, move your hand through the air and uh, sort of feel gases, if you will. So the classical definition of matter is anything that has mass and takes up space. Um, and we'll talk more about matter today. Energy is hard to get a grip on both uh, physically and um, just conceptually. Uh, the classical definition of energy is the ability to do work. Um, that's not really an intuitive definition. I mean, if you were, I mean, for instance, light is a form of energy. So if you were on Jeopardy and uh, somebody said the ability to do work, boom, what is light? Right? It, it, it doesn't really make sense. So um, an alternate definition I like of energy is the ability to cause change, make things happen. Because if you ever notice any kind of change, there's always energy involved. And then finally, the physical universe is composed of forces. And an easy, easy definition of a force is a push or a pull. All right, so uh, you push on your neighbor, you are exerting a force on your neighbor. Uh, you learned about, in physics, maybe the force of gravity. Well, uh, the force of gravity is always, what is it, a push or a pull? It is always a pull. All right, so these are the bare bone basics of the physical universe, and today we're going to focus on matter. So, atoms, as you probably have already learned, are the building blocks of matter. Now, even though there's millions and millions of types of substances in the universe, how many flavors of atoms are there? Uh, can you think of a number offhand? Well, maybe you recognize your old friend here, the periodic table. So is a round number for this, how many flavors of atoms? A round number about 100. If you want to be more specific, uh, there are 92 naturally occurring elements. So we can find uranium on here. I can change pointer options here. Pen, laser pointer, let's switch to a laser pointer. All right, so here's uranium right here. Um, that is the largest naturally occurring atom. But we've been making synthetic elements, and they've just been some of the news even recently within the last couple of years. But fortunately, we're biology, we're not chemistry. You don't have to memorize the whole periodic table. There are six which are most common to living things. And um, so if we want to know what are the what atoms make up more than 96% of the atoms in your body or the atoms of any living organism. We're talking worms, bacteria, fern plants. Well, I like to remember these six types of atoms as chinops. All right, so what do these represent? C, hopefully you know, stands for carbon. H, hydrogen. N, nitrogen. O, oxygen. P, what's that? Is it potassium or is it phosphorus? It is phosphorus. <laughs> and then finally, S, sulfur. So most of the atoms in your body, over 96% of your body, your dog's body, your mom and dad's body, an earthworm's body, are made of one of these six types of atoms. So you definitely should know how to spell those. 
All right, so let's go on a little further. All right, so again, here's the classic Bohr model. Here's a dense nucleus in the middle of the atom and these little particles whizzing around. Um, so any element on the periodic table, whether it's boron or carbon or hydrogen or gold, has three main particles, three subatomic particles that make up the atom. So can you think of one that lives in the nucleus here? So maybe you're thinking a basic subatomic particle would be the proton, and you would be correct. There is a pro particle called a proton. It lives in the nucleus. Do you remember the charge of a proton from your reading or from high school? The charge is plus one. So let's put this in a little chart here. Oh, and I guess I should have mentioned if you have a lecture guide where um, you can actually follow along and put the notes in the lecture guide while you're watching this video, and then you have fewer things to fill in in class. All right, so one subatomic particle is the proton. It lives in the nucleus. It has a plus one charge. Now, in measuring the mass of a proton, grams is pretty useless. I mean, the mass of one proton is something like 1.6 times 10 to the negative 21st grams. I mean, what does that even mean? You can't picture that. So since grams are useless, and scientists just invented, invented their own mass unit just to use for atoms, and since we're talking about a mass unit just for atoms, we decide to call it an AMU. We made it up. We're humans. We're allowed to do that. And since we made this up, we just said, hey, a proton has a mass of one. One AMU. Um, if you're in the majors, or probably even the non-majors class, um, an AMU is also referred to as a Dalton. So one AMU and one Dalton are the exact same thing. Um, John Dalton was actually a, a high school chemistry teacher who lived in the 1800s, and he was the first person to come up with a real good model for um, what an atom might look like. All right, can you think of another particle that exists in the nucleus? Well, a second particle would be the neutron. So the neutron also exists in the nucleus, and as the name suggests, a neutron is neutral. It also has, so therefore it has no charge. So a neutron lives in the nucleus, is neutral. And it's just about the same size as a proton, maybe a tiny bit bigger, but pretty much one AMU, one atomic mass unit. And finally, I bet you know, what's the name of the third particle? If you're thinking an electron, you are correct. These are the particles that go whizzing around and um, in the, um, um, in these orbits. So here we go, the electron, Sometimes these are called sh electron shells, sometimes they're called energy levels, sometimes they're called electron clouds, all those are fine. And the electron has a charge, it has a negative one charge. So just don't say it has a negative charge, it has a negative one charge. And look at its size, is it this more th is the mass of an electron greater than, less than, or the same size as a proton? Well, not only is it less than the size of a proton, it's a lot less. An electron has about one two thousandth the size, one two thousandth the mass as that of a proton. This is for real. An electron is as close to nothing as you can get and still have something. It's as close to nothing as you can get and still have something. And we, we can't subdivide an electron. It's the smallest bit of matter we know of. Like you might have heard of particle accelerators where they take protons and neutrons and whiz them up faster and faster, faster and faster near the speed of light, and they smash them together, and then you get lots of little particles coming out. Well, can't subdivide an electron. You can smash protons and neutrons, but not electrons. So these are the three basic particles that you find in any atom, whether it's carbon or gold or iodine, and they're all identical. You can swap out gold electrons with boron electrons with sodium electrons, all right? So, uh, but their arrangement is what gives the atoms their different characteristics. So the last thing we're going to go over in this short introductory video is some basic vocabulary. And again, a lot of this might be familiar to you from high school, but you know, you might be a little rusty on it. So the first vocabulary term is atomic number. An atomic number is represented by the letter Z. The definition is as follows. The atomic number is the number of protons in the nucleus of an atom. It's the number of protons in the nucleus of an atom. And this is extremely important because it determines the identity of an atom, what flavor it is. So if you have six protons, 
Doesn't matter how many neutrons you have, doesn't matter how many electrons you have, you are carbon. If you have one proton, doesn't matter how many neutrons you have, how many electrons, you are hydrogen. So it's the number of protons that determines the identity of the atom. So the atomic number is the number of protons. The atomic mass is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. Electrons are so tiny we don't even count them up. So the atomic mass, which is represented by the letter M, is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. So far so good. We're almost done. All right, valence electrons. Valence electrons are the electrons in the outermost energy level of an atom. So the valence electrons are the electrons in the outermost energy level of an atom. Okay? Then we have the octet rule. Now, oc, you should know, is a prefix, which means, drum roll, eight. You know, like an octopus has eight limbs, eight tentacles. So what the octet rule states is that an atom is happiest. All right. Maybe atoms can't really be happy, but I, I like to think of them as happy. All right, so an atom is happiest or most stable when it has eight valence electrons. So that's what the octet rule says. An atom is happiest or most stable when it has eight valence electrons. And finally, we have the bus seat rule. And uh, you might not remember that in high school because, uh, well, I made it up. So we will start here where we will discuss the bus seat rule in class and then get on with more atomic structure and bond bonding so we can then dig down into biology. We'll see you in class. Bye.